So let me introduce our lovely panel. Oh, we are live. We are streaming live. Hello, live, live onlineers. Um, so we are on film. And questions, please, we need questions. Um, and they can come from online, and they can come from you guys here in person. Um, so yeah, great. OK, so we have, first to my right, is Leif Persweden. Persweden. For Sweden. Sweden. That's my biggest anxiety is people's names. Okay, so Leif is a writer, a botanist, a nature communicator with a face down, bottom up approach to watching wildlife. I like that image. Um, Leif grew up in rural Wiltshire where he taught himself how to identify the local flora and has championed our wild plants and the joy they bring ever since. And he is the author of The Orchid Hunter and where the wildflowers grow. Then we have Dr. Imogen Napper. She, her, sorry, we need to do pronouns. I'm a she, her, he, him, she, her. Imogen is a marine scientist and National Geographic explorer. Imogen has been described as a plastic detective um, as her research investigates different sources of plastic pollution into the environment. And her work has influenced the banning of microbeads in facial scrubs. It would be fantastic to hear about that in a bit. Um, and her research shows how small changes can make big differences and that larger environmental commitments are needed by industry and governments globally. Then we have Francesca Willow, she, her. Francesca is an artist, writer, and activist based here in Cornwall. Um, her work aims to take a, a holistic, fact-based approach to sustainable living and so, so, social justice, believing that change requires a combination of consumer choice, intersectional collective action, and policy change. She hopes to equip and aspire people to live a more conscious, informed lifestyle, as well as thoughtfully discussing system change and regenerative futures. Welcome. Um, Jasmine Isha Qureshi, they, she, Jasmine, is a writer, journalist, and wildlife TV researcher, currently working at Netflix um, for Wild Space Productions. She has also worked for the BBC, the Bumblebee Conservation Trust, and is, and is a youth, youth, works for a youth lead nature organization, a focus on nature. She is an activist, marine biologist, and public speaker. Welcome. And finally, but not least, we got Amelia Twine, she, her. Amelia is a campaigner for sustainable fashion. She founded Sustainable Fashion Week in 2020, which I can't believe this is the world's only fashion week of its kind, like that. Uh, it, it ignites community-led action to inspire, empower, and upskill people. And in addition to this, Amelia is currently working with the Fashion Roundtable Committees seeking to influence UK policy in favour of best practice in the fashion system. Thank you, guys. Thank you for joining me. Um, so we are talking about climate anxiety today. Um, and I guess, yeah, so as I touched on before, it's a subject that I am noticing coming up more and more um, in my clinical work. Um, particularly with young people, but also parents um, seem quite affected by the subject. Um, I practice in Falmouth, and so my, my practice is near to the university there, and I have had students from the sort of marine or, um, or the bio, bioscience courses, and, and some of the material has triggered in them, you know, um, really painful anxiety. Um, lots of worrying thoughts, lots of rumination. And it is a subject that, as a parent myself, sometimes when it comes into the room, I feel myself kind of brace, like I have to hold on to the chair and think, okay, like, because I'm not immune to this either. Um, and so I just wanted to check in with you guys, because it's definitely something that comes in waves me in and out, um, and, and it can generate a real place of hopelessness and of kind of what's the point. So I thought we could start by just each of us checking in or sharing where you are cur currently at in terms of your own climate anxiety. If that's all right, are you all right to start, yeah, Leif? Hi, everyone. Um, yes, yeah, so I'm a botanist. 
um, have spent my entire life obsessed with nature. And so I'm very much coming at this from a sort of biodiversity point of view. Um, obviously, you've got biodiversity crisis and climate crisis, which are often talked about completely separately, but are completely interlinked, completely inextricable from one another. So my viewpoint is very much um, sort of, yeah, from the nature viewpoint. And so I find myself, um, you know, all the anxiety around surrounding both those crises comes from um, seeing all the horrible things which are happening to nature, particularly um, because you know that's the thing I can actually see when I go outside. I can see these effects um, happening uh, based on all these all these organisms that I've grown up loving. So for me, it's it is there all the time. Um, you know, obviously sometimes it's better sometimes it's worse um, I regularly cry about it but also find a huge amount of joy um, in all these things as well so uh, yeah it's definitely ups and downs it's something I have always been aware of but have thought a lot more about since the pandemic um, I think obviously I had a lot of time to sort of sit and think and have sort of reassessed various ways uh, that I live my life uh, since the pandemic um, yeah, so that's sort of the, the place I'm coming from. Thank you. Image of uh, climate anxiety for me is something that I'm still trying to figure out for myself in that it's so complicated and it can be quite overwhelming to understand exactly where you sit. So I'm a plastic pollution researcher and plastic pollution is quite visible that you can go to the beach and you can easily see the plastic washing up onto the beaches. But for climate, it's trickier because you can't necessarily see it. But I'm sure that all of you in the last year, we've seen more flooding, hotter temperatures. I remember doing Zoom calls to people in London and you know, they were trying to take off their shirts. They were trying to block all of the heat coming through their windows with foil or just shutting the curtains. And that's something that I've never experienced in my lifetime. So it was starting to become a lot more visible for me. But then something that you said, Leif, is that all the environments are interconnected. And the word that keeps coming up for me is overconsumption and why we keep overconsuming. So I think we need to think of it like a house. And with our own home where we're in, if something's broken, we fix it. If something's dirty, we clean it up. And we're looking after it. And in turn, it looks after ourselves. And now we need to spread that to our planet and realize that we have got ownership of it. And that means that we need to protect it but it's making sure that we incentivize, making sure that we protect the place that is our home. Thank you so much. So Francesca, where are you at? Yeah, um, I would say I come to this from more of an activist kind of perspective and potentially like a little bit more rare, I'm actually walking in today pretty feeling pretty good. Um, and that is mainly, I can talk about it more, but one of the campaigns that I work on, we had a really big climate win this week. Um, I work a lot around campaigning uh, around fossil fuel sponsorship of arts, culture, the creative industries. Um, some people might have seen it, it was reported quite widely in media, but um, one of the groups I work with, we found out this week that uh, the Royal Opera House had ended their relationship with BP after 33 years. That was a campaign I was working on. Massive group of people, it was not me. <laughs> um, but things like that. Um, it's really incredible because that is a campaign, this overarching campaign has gone on since around 2012, so just over a decade, and we have seen, whew, it was 14, it might be 17 now, like major institutions drop fossil fuel, uh, cut ties with fossil fuel industry completely, and we have seen major changes because of that. Um, and so just knowing, firstly, in a short length of time, um, seeing so many things be achieved, but also knowing that there are large impacts, not just in terms of uh, fossil fuel companies trying to make their image seem more palatable, but we know from FY requests and information that we've gathered that a lot of those sponsorships were used to do sort of schmoozing of politicians and backdoor deals to help these companies uh, acquire drilling licenses to get more oil and gas out of the ground. So we know that this has very tangible impacts on these huge titans of these industries. And I'm sure lots of people have also heard the fact, but you know, a hundred fossil fuel uh, 100 companies are responsible for 71% of emissions, I think since the 1980s. And those are companies that have names and have CEOs who have names and have staff who have names. Um, and so I'm feeling 
better now because a lot of it is very existential ideas around climate anxiety and we sort of see these things happening. But then also I'm very glad to be part of campaigns where we are strategic in what we target. And so when we get those wins, we know that it does have a real impact. And so for once I'm feeling great. So that's nice. We'll see how long it lasts, but it's good now. I'm good. And I think that's, but actually in terms of the subject really, I suppose is an important thing to just note, isn't it? That it's yeah. like, actually you've been really anxious or there's been a place where you've been really low and then, and actually right now mm -hmm. you're feeling, I don't know, how would you describe how you're feeling? Oh, I cried with, ha with joy because I was like really ramping up for all of these action plans that I had over the next few weeks because it's a bit of a crunch time. A lot of these deals are coming to the end so we're finding out of things like being renewed. So I was like all systems go and then I just got a call at 11 p.m. I think it was on, Mon it was on Tuesday and they were like, yeah, so, so we've won. <laughs> and I was, my first thing was like, oh, I've not got any work to do now. And then the next day it really sunk in and I was like, oh, I, we haven't got any work to do because we, we, we did it. And then I cried for like a good hour in a public cafe, um, but cried for joy. And it's, it is good to definitely take that as well because obviously then you're like, right, on to the next, time for the Science Museum. Um, <laughs> but actually it's really important to recognize that those wins, mm. that even that, this feels quite major because the Royal Opera House is a huge institution, but still can be seen as small. You haven't like ended fossil fuels now, but just to remember like, actually this really does matter. 10 years ago, the cultural landscape in London was completely different to where it is now. Like BP and Shell's name was absolutely everywhere. And essentially the entire industry is at the point where they nearly wholesale rejected them now. And that is a massive shift mm. in a short space of time with hundreds of people worked on that. Like I am the teeniest, tiniest little cog, but it's really well, important. Fantastic work. Thank you for doing that. Um, Jasmine, hello. Where are you at? I think with me, it takes a multi-tiered kind of approach as with most of the things that I do. Um, so like my anxiety, I mean, around this takes a multi-tiered approach. So on one hand, I've got the um, work that I do around conservation and wildlife, and that mainly spans into marine biology and marine mammals and wildlife in the ocean. And so there's a great level of anxiety that I have around that, but that is to do with mainly being quite um, separated from that environment. And I think a lot of us, when we think about the ocean, we think about a very far off environment that we're not very connected to. And so we can get quite anxious about the news, about things we're being told in terms of how climate change is affecting the ocean, in terms of how the ocean then affects us, in terms of the great levels of pollution there are in the ocean. So I have quite a significant level of anxiety around that, even though I know the science. And so I'm, I'm quite empathetic of people who don't even know the science and are getting anxious because of what's happening to the ocean. So there's a level of empathy and understanding around the anxiety in that kind of place. And the same with um, my interest in insects and entomology, which is another um, thing that I study and a subject that I talk to a lot of different peer groups about. Um, and when I talk to these people, um, what really comes to the forefront is even if you don't know that much about insects, even if you're not the biggest fan of bugs, which most people are not, um, you, do, you do tend to understand that this is a, a small part of our world, but a very important part of our world. Most people, if you don't see bugs around in, in a, a green area even, you know something's wrong because you know that there's, there's this significant part of the ecosystem that's missing. And unfortunately, they are declining. So there's my anxiety around that, which is heightened because of um, mainly seeing wildlife species going down and really this great sense of urgency that we should have because of the extinction events that we've been warned about. But at the same time, I also have my work in um, wildlife television and wildlife media. So as you said, I'm, I work for Netflix. Um, I do just have to say the views are my own. I got in trouble when I was working for the BBC and <laughs> I said something about cats and they told me I couldn't say that. But um, it's never mind. Um, but so I work for Netflix, I work for Wild Space and we make wildlife television programs and we make documentaries and one of the biggest things that you can see when you're working documentaries is you're seeing what the public sees and you're seeing what is shown on the forefront of the climate crisis. Now, as a scientist, I'm behind the scenes of that with the data, with the wildlife, with the activists who are working on it, and I can see some of the challenges and some of the pain 
But if you're working in TV, you see that surface level, um, that surface picture, and you see what everyone else in the public sees about climate change. And to be honest, that actually gives me quite a lot of hope because the documentaries that are coming out now, even though they have a terrifying spin in some cases, there's a lot of work being done to showcase the people on the ground who are working towards making everything better. And I know that we are struggling with our sense of urgency, with our time, with our anxiety, but more and more of us are getting involved. And this panel is, you know, that's one of the examples. There's, there probably wouldn't have been a few years ago any such thing as a climate anxiety panel. And people would argue because it wasn't as bad, but it was quite bad then as well. So the fact that it's here now is not a testament to it getting significantly worse, but I would hope more a testament to people understanding more and showing more appreciation for the work that's being done to counteract the climate anxiety and the climate crisis. So that gives me hope, I think, seeing documentaries being made about people who are working in the environment and about animals too, but intertwining those two things. Um, because as a journalist and as someone who um, is mainly intersectional in my identity and also in what I speak about in terms of being a scientist and also being someone who speaks about um, other topics that range from political science to um, social structure, I tend to want to know about a lot of different things um, all the time. And that means that I have to make other people understand where I'm coming from because I have to tell them, oh, I'm interested in this thing, this thing, and this thing, and they all interlink in this way. Um, and one of the reasons why I believe it's important for me to be here today is something that I think I was anxious about before, but I see it getting better, and this is to do with the climate, which is the representation that there is in the arguments for climate anxiety and climate change. Now, of course, as you can see on this panel, I'm the only person who is of like um, Asian descent. I am Pakistani and Indian. And for me, the representation of a group of people who exist on this planet and are affected the most by the climate crisis and yet know the least is something that was very anxiety inducing to me um, until a couple of years ago. But now I see more people getting traction. I see more people talking about it. And like all things to do with the climate crisis, it's not going fast enough but that might be more of a testament to the fact that we're only starting to look up now and less of a testament to the fact that we're not doing enough. So I think we should have hope um, and really put a positive spin on things so that we can get people to action their um, emotion and to turn it into more of a power than uh, a, de a, a debilitating um, struggle. Um, and that's why one of my main um, points um, when I'm talking about how to quell climate anxiety and stress, and we'll talk about this later, I'm sure, is to tell people to actually take a rest as opposed to taking up action because it can get very overwhelming and it's very, very hard in the current climate that we have um, to do things when you're feeling so overwhelmed by so much information. So I think for me, it, there's a lot of different ways that I'm feeling anxious and not anxious, and I think that's fine because I think a multi-layered approach to anything to do with the environment, to anything to do with people, is probably the only way that we can progress um, in that sense. Thank you. Thank you, Jasmine. And Amelia. Um, I sort of lost the question, because I've been so interested in what yeah, you were saying. How, how's your climate anxiety? Where are you at with it? Where, I mean, where have you been? And um, I think... Um, I've had climate anxiety from a very young age. Um, I grew up on, on organic farms um, as a youngster. And so although I wasn't necessarily involved with the organic farming, I grew up in a, an environment where food security was talked about all the time and um, farming specifically, but also living in harmony with nature and, um, and kind of value of biodynamic farming and all these kind of things. And so that awareness was, I think I carried it through life. Um, but as I got older and as I became a teenager and just as anxiety hits you as a teen generally, I think this was a real focus for me because I couldn't see with the knowledge I had then, which is compared to now was, you know, almost nothing. Um, with the knowledge I had then, I couldn't see what I felt was a safe future, um, even for people in the in the um the global north and the west you know it seemed like it was just it felt very unsafe to me um and so even from my late teens and early 20s i decided that's what i wanted to do with my career and um but didn't know where to start and didn't know what uh like avenue to to take 
um, but so I've gone down a few different routes, but always carried with me that sense of um, sense of fear that the, the future wasn't safe and that we weren't doing enough quickly enough to resolve that and put in place different ways of living, different systems which were going to support all of us, no matter what our um, backgrounds were or income brackets were. Um, and that has obviously led me to found Sustainable Fashion Week as with the focus on community-led action and empowerment um, for the individual. Um, but also, I think my focus, just listening to you all now, um, I think you're right in terms of that multi-layered approach, I think is really important because my driving force every day that helps me convert anxiety, um, uh, helps me deal with my anxiety is to convert it into action. So it's like I get up, feel the fear, and then think, what am I going to do about it? And then, so um, I take action all the time, all the time, in my job, at home, in, with my parenting. Whatever I do, it's all about converting the fear into action. But I think it's really valuable what you were saying around also taking a rest. Um, th there are loads of different aspects that we can um, draw upon, loads of different resources we can draw upon to deal with anxiety. Um, I think one of, the, one of my big ones which hasn't come up yet necessarily is um, is also resilience, like building like individual res like resilience and also collective resilience as a community. Because I think the future we are looking into is going to be radically different from the one we from the life we live now, and that um, can be a really really positive thing. That radical difference I think can be really exciting. Um, but we also um, we need to sort of participate in creating that, and we need to really um, take action now and participate to ensure that that can happen in the future. And part of that is becoming resilient, getting off our laptops, getting off our phones, getting our hands dirty, learning skills with our hands. I think we're moving, from my perspective, further and further away from making use of this incredible um, power that we have in our hands. And we spend so much time tapping and clicking. And that won't be something, I don't believe, which serves us in the future. I think we need to learn to use our hands and learn to become resilient as part of that. Um, from obviously, what I'm advocating for every single day is learning to sew. I think it's a, it's not a, I don't see it as a craft, I don't see it as an art form, I see it as a technical skill and one that is necessary for all of us to learn to keep our clothing alive, etc. But there are so many different things, <coughs> excuse me, there are so many different things we can do uh, which kind of reconnect us with our hands, with our own um, ability to be resilient and I think that's something that we should yeah all have a think about thank you all so we're going to open it up in a minute for questions um, I've also noticed that I need to get my phone because we have um, online people are going to send through questions on my phone and it's it's hidden under here um, but I wanted to just there was something so there's you guys were talking there about <laughs> hi just getting my phone um, yeah, the, Amelia, you were touching on there that there's something about the anxiety and how you were able to find a way to kind of activate, to move through that anxiety towards some action, towards something. And, that, and has that helped? Do you find that has helped with your anxiety that you felt as a child? Yeah, yeah absolutely. I think um, having, having purpose is what gets me up every day and makes me feel like uh, I have the power to change what I see in the future I think everybody if possible needs to find that purpose um, because it is something that gets you out of bed um, and yeah I think and, and working together as well is something that I think um, is really valuable because once you've once you found your community found your kind of collective that sense of power just increases and also, when Amelia said, a lot of you nodded about the kind of visualising how the future might be and that not being... You said that might be a positive thing. We don't know that, that, that with community resilience and stuff. But, and some of you were nodding there. We, I don't know if you wanted... Or particularly you, Imogen. I don't know if you wanted to respond. Was there something...? Uh, I think change can be really scary, mm. but change can also be there for the better. And something in my research that made me realize that change can be good is actually my first research project that I ever did. And we looked at microbeads and facial scrubs. Uh, microbeads are tiny little plastic particles that were put into facial scrubs to act as exfoliants. And maybe some of you remember them. I actually used to use them and I had no idea it contained plastic. But no one knew how many microbeads could be in one bottle. 
So in this first research piece, we got loads of different facial scrubs that contain plastic. We extracted the plastic, and we found that three million could be in one bottle. So on a squirt on your hand, there could be thousands of tiny plastic particles that you wash your face, they potentially go down the drain, through the sewage treatment works, and then into our ocean. And it's completely not necessary. But then the exciting part is the change that happened, and especially for the general public like you and me, that research could give us the evidence and a voice to make our own decisions for the better for the planet. So in a, in a matter of seconds, you could go to the supermarket, you could look on the back of an ingredients list. If it said plastic, such as polyethylene, you wouldn't buy that product and you'd get a natural alternative instead. And it'd be the same price or maybe even cheaper. So with this huge boycott and people being angry that they were potentially just polluting the waters around us through washing their face, they started to boycott it. Then industry started to listen and realized it was really unpopular. So they started to voluntarily remove microbeads from their products. And then this led to governments listening around the world where we took this research to them and said, here's the evidence. What do you think? What should we do? And they started to make legislation banning microbeads and facial scrubs. And even though it's a small proportion of plastic going into the marine environment, it really got people talking and saying that actually the small difference that I can do can have a huge difference to the planet. So I think that change is good, but we just have to keep talking and discussing and seeing where that change needs to happen. Can I add something yeah, to that sure. as well? Um, I just think it's also important to note that um, when we talk about this radically different future and what that might look like, um, obviously we're not living in it yet, but it's also good to remind ourselves if we're thinking from comparing like what my life looks like on a day-to-day -day versus 20 years time, we have to remember that day-to-day -day, there are a lot of people for which life is not good right now because of the systems that we exist within. So actually it's really exciting because everything literally that exists around us like as in terms of society, is everything, uh, these are all things that people just invented one day. We didn't come out of the womb being like, time to get a job. Um, and so there's actually like, there's radical possibilities for what we can rebuild, um, what we can dismantle and what we can rebuild and the kind of future that we can design is actually completely up to us. Because there are a lot of people, and maybe a lot of it is the global majority of people in the global south, so we're not necessarily seeing them every day. Or when we do, it's because we've got mass flooding somewhere. Um, or frontline defenders. There's all these things that life isn't actually great for them right now because of the systems that are working to oppress them. So actually, although things might look really different day to day, there's also like all these incredible possibilities to have a much more liberated and equitable future for everyone. And that is hard in the sense that the amount of change that needs to happen to get there. But also that's something that we should all really be striving for anyway. And isn't that a better way to think about it? Like it's hard. But actually, we could have a world where lots of people are free and liberated and happy. And that would help a lot of people's mental health as well, I think. So it's also an exciting challenge and an opportunity, I think. I think, can I just add one thing to that, which is them um, talking about the systems that are in place. I think it serves them if we are anxious and afraid. Mm -hmm. that, that sense of... Um, being um, without power and without knowing how to act serves the system in place. So the more we um, can convert our anxiety into hope and optimism and then move on from hope and optimism into action, actually the more likely we're, you know, we, are, we are to create in that future that we want that is more equitable. So I think remember that your fear serves the system in a way that your action doesn't. I think, yeah, I really I like the point about radical change right now seeming like quite a terrifying thing because it is an uprooting of a lifestyle that we've upheld for a very long time. And I think the uprooting of that is what's terrifying, but the eventual conclusion of that into something that we can mold ourselves um, and hopefully mold by being more aware of some of the issues that are around us as opposed to our past where we've not been as aware of those issues, which has led us to where we are today and perhaps being more aware of that and allowing us to then mold a future that is more built around people's comfortable habits, people's validation, the, the comfort of people is really where we wanna go. We want a, an environment and a society that comforts and secures people's lives and a massive aspect of the comfort and security of people around the planet um, and here is the climate. 
So you would hope that that would be a key aspect of making a more comfortable society, you know, sustainable clothing, all of these different things. These are aspects of a comfortable future um, and a sustainable future. And the point that was just made about people in different societies really struggling right now because of the climate crisis is almost it's not it shouldn't be at the forefront of our minds necessarily if it's causing us undue stress but it should be a big part of what we think about when we think about climate stress and climate anxiety yes we are allowed to be stressed and anxious and tired but take a minute to rest and take a minute to have a break so that you aren't overwhelmed so that you have more power to fight for those who don't have the option to rest and i think that's a big point because i think rest is definitely a form of rebellion that people don't talk about because it is this idea that we have the capacity to rest, we have the capacity to take a break. Why not take it? Because the system is often telling us that we should simply just go forward, keep going, keep being in this rat race forever and ever and ever. And one of the key aspects of capitalism, of the corporate society that, it, that, that has been built to sort of feed and clothe us that is built on constant work. That's one of its key aspects. That's one of the main reasons why we get burnt out. That's one of the main reasons we get anxiety is because there's so much being thrown at us all the time. We're not given a moment to rest. Mm -hmm. And so if you take the moment to rest, you will have more power to then stop the system from working, one, and two, then fight to make and build a better system. Mm -hmm. So I really like the idea that the hope that we have is we can uproot what we have now and change it, but I think what needs to be talked about more is the conclusive aftermath of the uprooting, because oftentimes we just talk about the uprooting, and that's what makes people cry anxious, is the fact that it's just chaos, and that's not what we want. We don't just want uprooting, leave it as chaos. We want uprooting, and then we want change. We want to build something better and different. Life. Yeah, just very briefly, on, on the subject of comfort, um, I think we need to become comfortable with being in discomfort. Because um, I think today we, leave, we lead these lives that are just so comfortable. You know, we, we've come to sort of assume, or assume that it's sort of our right to fly to the other side of the world or go to the supermarket and expect to find oranges and blueberries and things, you know, out of season just there on the shelves that we can we can pick up. And I think it's something that I'm trying to get my head around at the moment is trying to think, okay, these things are not normal. You know, even like, you know, one, 200 years ago, they're just like not even a thing. And if you think about how long humans have been around, it's, it's it would just be unthinkable that you could get these things from the other side of the world just like that. And so I think, yeah, if we can try and become more comfortable with the idea, idea of being slightly less comfortable. Um, that's a really, really good way of thinking about the future as well, because obviously at some point we're not going to be able to get our blueberries from the other side of the world or um, just be able to f fly and go on holiday uh, whenever we like. So, yeah, I like that idea of... Can I add great. something yeah, more to that? And then we'll move on to questions, because I know there are questions coming through on my phone, and also you guys might have questions. Well, I think I think... Um, one aspect of growing comfortable with the idea of discomfort is this idea that you have to go through a certain level of discomfort in order to learn a process. And a very big and key part of having respect for the environment, uh, having respect for especially the food that we eat and the plants that grow, is understanding the process by which they get there and the process by which you attain them. And that is a process that we need to understand around farming, agriculture, wildlife conservation, even here, I spent most of my break wandering around the rainforest biome and I wanna live in there, it yeah. is so cool, my God. But even looking around, in my head was constantly turning questions. How do these plants get pollinated? Is there a native, what, what do the native insect wildlife look like over here? What's the biodiversity like? Why, you know, why is there a robin in here? <laughs> it's like, you know, what, what is- I've been asking that all week, like, all weekend. <laughs> but it's just, it's incredible, but, What's happening there is I'm going through the discomfort of not, I'm not simply going into an environment and simply thinking, okay, this is fine, this is how everything is, this is okay, this is good. I'm thinking this is complex and incredible and parts of this are good and parts of this might not be so good yet maybe, 
but I'm going through the discomfort of learning about the process. And that I think is essential. It's this allowance of ourselves to think, if everything is not as old it should be, perhaps we need to learn about why, and perhaps we need to learn about even the things that are as they should be. Why, why are they there? Mm. What is this that's happening? And we've become so used to, I think, simply being handed something and su just being suggested or told that's how things are, you should not learn. And a big aspect that will come about more often and is coming about more is the questioning of the status quo because people mm. are understanding that it doesn't work. And so we have to question how it works. We have to question ourselves and we have to question the processes that happen and then be in discomfort around, oh my God, I need to question things. I need to understand how things work, but that's good because that means you can work at a process by which you can change it for the better. Yeah, and I'm reframing that discomfort to some, like an opportunity, isn't it? So, um, and that's the same psychologically <laughs> processing. When you learn about yourself, it's extremely uncomfortable at times. It's, um, yeah, to, to grow and to become more. So I want to open it up now. For, um, does anybody have any questions for our panelists? Yes, please, down the front here. I'm just going to get you a microphone because we're on the um, film. Um, okay, so my question is that... Um, Nowadays, we see this kind of push towards um, reaching out to um, different ages, different um, religions, ethnicities to all fight for the climate crisis, as well as like not just biologists and activists who are doing it, so like people from different job sectors. Do you think that there should be more of a push in like Western countries to get more people in involved? Like... Um, Jasmine, like you're here and it's really nice to see like a person of colour, but it's very far and few. Um, I know that personally, like I do marine biology and I'm like one of the only brown people there and it's a recurring pattern um, because there are a lot of like people around the world who fight for the climate crisis because it's one of their religious beliefs or their native indigenous and what they do is respectful. But do you think there should be more of a push to get people like that involved? I definitely think so. And I think the only reason that I'm here is because that happened. Um, and when I did marine biology at university, I was one of five people of color in a lecture theater of about 300 odd people. There's not enough representation at all, especially with marine biology, which is quite a whitewashed subject anyway in the, in the UK, but that's a different subject. Um, the, so the, the point mainly is that with a future as unstable as the one we have now, the reason that we are here in a place of instability is because of the lack of diversity of perspective. We have arrived at a place in our current society whereupon there has been a very, very um, mainstream, like there's been one type of person, I think we all know who, who has had control over how we express, how we identify, how we um, produce policy, how we structure um, various types of work, how we build, everything has been controlled by this certain type of person. And so in order to regrow and uproot and rebuild, we need more perspectives. We need fresh perspectives because without fresh perspectives, you're never going to get anything done because if you think about it, the reason we're here is because of ideas being recycled. We can't keep using the same ideas. We can't keep having the same echo chambers. So I definitely think we need more people, but I don't think we just need more people. I think we need more people in specific areas and specific places where they can talk about things in a more useful fashion. So one of the things that I worked with, um, because I'm ambassador for the Bumblebee Conservation Trust, um, and I also work with the Natural History Museum and with certain other wildlife and conservation societies, on um, diversity tactics. And one of the things that we talk about is how to get people, especially young people, queer people, people of color, um, women, everyone who is considered a minority in today's society, we wanna get people into boardrooms. We don't just wanna get them into a job in conservation. Because if you look at the conservation sector, um, and I did an article for, the, um, for BBC Wildlife Magazine on this, it is the second least diverse sector in the UK, um, behind farming, of course there's gonna be a high level of anxiety there which is not scuppered by fresh perspective or not quelled by people coming in with an understanding of where they grow up and how this could help or an understanding that their community has a lot of people that don't understand it so maybe we could educate them and they could all help. There's none of that because these are simply echo chambers of the same people. 
And if you look at the wildlife sector, there is diversity, but it's at a base level. And they're really, and the conservation sector and even the climate sector, it's very much activists and then base level um, workers. We need people in boardrooms and people in higher, higher levels of um, policy making so that they can actually say, this is my experience in this climate sector. This is my experience as someone who's grown up in inner city London. This is my experience as someone who's grown up in an area with lots of emissions. I know who needs to change and who needs who needs help because that will help. I recently had a conversation actually with um, a group of activists because we were gonna go and talk to the London mayor's team about re-greening London and about what, what it takes to do that. And one of the main things we talked about is if you think about the climate crisis and what's making us anxious, what's making us anxious is a rise in emissions, it's a rise in pollution. Where does that stem from? That stems from cities. Where does that stem from in cities? It stems from inner city areas. Who lives in inner city areas? Minorities. That's who lives there. These people are affected by it every day and yet they are not in the room. And if they were, it's not even a case of they should have a part to play. They could help you. They could do the work for you because they live there and they could change that environment for the better and then you wouldn't have to be so anxious about it anymore. So it's, it's not even on, on that level just about fairness and equality, which is obviously very important. It's also about urgency. If you want things to change and you really do want things to change, mark my words, then you really need to get those people involved because they can do that work that we are simply anxious about and far away from. Even myself who grew up in inner city London, I don't live there anymore. So even to an extent, I myself am displaced from that fight. And I think it's, it's very important to get more people involved with different fresh perspectives, but put them in the right places because tokenism is a thing. Yeah. Um, I've often been a tick box on many panels and I don't wanna say I'm a tick box on this panel, but to an extent I might be. But it is useful that I'm here, even if I am, because it, yeah. it is representation and it is a fresh perspective even if it is at this level, not to the level that I would like it to be. So I think there is a multi-tiered way of going about it, but definitely more people is, um, that's a base level answer to that. Yeah, absolutely. Can Thank I add, you. Yeah, just please. Obviously I'm not coming from that perspective. I just wanted to add on a policy level, there is also, this is a something we'll see a lot more of in terms of just to add something about the global north slash the west, there is definitely more, um, there should be more responsibility at the doors of white global north countries who hold so much more responsibility for the climate crisis. I know I'm probably like preaching to the choir here, but I just thought it was good to name it as well, just to like add on that that is really important because these are the conversations <laughs> we're going to see more as more things like COP and clim climate conferences happen. Um, in two ways, you'll see it around discussions of like loss and damages and that funding and like definitely as activists or like civil society, those are things that we should also push our governments on. You know, the UK bears so much historic responsibility for the climate crisis and bears very little of the brunt of the effects at this time. Um, and so when people are coming from island nation states who might not actually have any land in five, ten years, that we do have a financial responsibility that looks like reparations and looks like financing that. Um, and I just think that's also something to like name and acknowledge because often young people, queer people, minorities, people from global south countries, indigenous people often do get shut out of climate conferences. There are so many issues around those spaces a lot of the time that make them very hard to access. And so it's good for all of us, even though that's sort of slightly aside to, should we advocate for more, um, more diverse people in certain industries, but also all of us can get involved around lobbying our governments to like within the UK to do the right thing and that's also important. I just, tiny thing, I know we got, um, but um, to add to that as well, I think, um, and especially with the audience I think we've got here, sometimes, um, and a question that I receive a lot is, um, because of what I'm talking about, I'm talking about environmentalism, so I will generally be directing it to a certain um, type of person, and a lot of people ask, well, if I'm not any of the minorities that you've said, how can I help? You know, I'm, I'm an ally, I really want to help, what do I do? Because I don't want to overshadow the voices of those who really need to talk. And I would say, do not be ashamed of the fact that you have privilege, because that is not helpful. Um, I have a certain level of privilege, and this understanding of privilege is something that really needs to be dissected further anyway, but on a base level, it is about having a power that no one else has, and having 
a space in a room that no one else has. And for me, that is power you can use to help those who don't have that power. You can open doors for those people. You can, in a conversation, if someone's talking about the climate crisis and there's someone else who you perhaps know probably is more qualified but is maybe a woman or is someone who's not going to get a voice, but perhaps someone who's a person of color or, you know, if they aren't gonna get that voice and you know that you've got control in that conversation, you can direct it towards them. Just simple things like that. And that will also help with the climate anxiety that we have because what you're doing is you're putting essential chess pieces in place to win that game because you are pushing people to the forefront and into the spotlight you have an essential voice and an essential lived experience so i would not say that you should be ashamed of having privilege i would say use it as the weapon that it is but use it in a way that's good because if you put it down and don't use it the people who use it for bad will use it um and then you know, that's not going to be a good outcome, and we know that. So I would say in terms of people speaking about it, it really does affect everyone, and everyone should be speaking about it, but in different ways and on different levels. Thank you so much. Um, we have a question that's come through online. Thank you, online. Um, and it is, who are your eco-heroes at the moment? Has anybody got any particular... Uh, so my mind automatically goes to some organisations I really admire. So some of them are based down in Cornwall itself, so Surfs Against Sewage. And I think it's all about taking research and what people really care about and then taking that to a higher level. So then taking that to government and making sure that everyone's voice gets heard. So I'm sure we've all heard about sewage being discharged into the oceans, which is our a place that we go to enjoy, and they're lobbying to make sure that that doesn't happen and that these people are held accountable. So if they're polluting the environment, that there'll be a consequence. And then there's the Marine Conservation Society, which are lobbying in fashion that maybe there should be filters on washing machines to make sure that we capture these pesky fibers that are entering the ocean. So it's a big discussion about holding government's industry accountable, and that can be led by some amazing organizations such as those two. Fantastic. Leif, did you have some? Yeah, again, an organization. Um, for me, and it might seem slightly tangential at first, but um, uh, Right to Rome have been absolutely amazing. Um, I only really, I always was always aware that in Scotland they have the right to roam. Here in England we don't. Um, but in the last couple of years, I've been aware that there's actually an organization who are you know, campaigning for the right to roam. And I think a lot of the problems that we have surrounding just, you know, this people in society just generally seem to not care about the climate. They don't care about nature. They don't care about all the damage that we're doing. And I think a large part of that is because we don't have access to nature. 92% um, of England is, you know, we can't, it's private property. We can't, um, you know, go and explore. And so I think all of these horrible behaviors and um, issues that we have, like people just not caring, um, are a sort of a symptom, if you like, of our disconnects with nature because we don't have access to it. And I, th I think we're not going to cure those things without fixing that connection. Um, so I love the right to roam. They're doing amazing things. They're getting really, really good traction now. Um, and I think if we can just get people outside connecting with all these amazing things, then people start to care about it. And then they start, you know, maybe doing something about it and changing the way they live their lives. Um, so yeah, right to roam for me. Uh, and I was just thinking, um, I know I was talking to you earlier about your Instagram account. But um, Leif's Instagram account, his, the joy he gets out of nature so much, it is, it's infectious, actually. I must admit, like, seeing the way you write about it and the pictures you take, it's like, yeah, and that kind of, I don't know, that, that infection, I think that that, you know, that could be, that could be the new COVID, <laughs> isn't it? Um, do we have, a, yeah, go for it. There's actually research as well linked on that that shows that if nature and going outside is accessible, then even cleaning it up, just connecting with nature, taking a walk on a beach, your mental health improves, so you feel happier, yeah. you feel more connected to your environment, and you're more likely to do it again. But we have to make sure that those places are accessible, because otherwise it's just a select few, so 100%. And the importance of soil 
that they're connecting and um, there's lots of uh, research around people with ADD, for example, if they put their bare feet in the ground, they're much more able to kind of like work or concentrate or there's lots of kind of really um, positive research in that area. And yet we were also, the soil is so poorly. <laughs> I have a. Oh, sorry. I was just going to say, if people want to learn more, there's also um, they've just announced the shortlist. There's a prize called the Spring Prize. It's a collaboration between Ethical Consumer Magazine and Lush, and they release this shortlist every year of regenerative projects that are working to regenerate soil and ecology, and working generally they're like grassroots local community efforts. Um, and there's also a whole category that's like indigenous wisdom and knowledge, and there's, so they're indigenous-led projects as well around the world. But all of those are focusing on whatever you want to call it, regeneration, permaculture, like those umbrella terms. But there's loads of people doing really cool things with soil, which is quite inspiring. And then people could start their own if they wanted to. I think as well, um, just adding to being in nature and it kind of quelling some of the anxiety that you have. And um, for me, as someone who's struggled with anxiety for quite a long time and a lot of um, things to do with neurodivergence, I also have a tick disorder. It means that being in nature, actually, I've realized counteracts all of the stresses that I have around these things. It means that yeah. I go into the natural world and even walking around um, the Eden project and coming from um, Bristol, which is where I'm based at the moment, um, I realize the difference, the difference in how I think about things, the difference in how much it cleared my head and how I'm able to breathe. And at the same time realizing, is this a useful way of thinking about wildlife, anxiety, and nature. Because if you think about it, what I've been talking about this entire time is we need to make nature more accessible for city dwellers. How are we gonna do that in a way that it emulates the reception that I get when I come to natural areas and I feel more calm? How are we gonna make that accessible for everyone? So that's not something that I know how to do, but I think that's a useful question to ask, is how do we make nature and the feeling of nature and the comfortability that we have and the anxiety that is softened when we go into nature, how do we make that an accessible feeling? Mm -hmm. Because it is in danger of becoming a feeling that is only prescribed to a certain few who are allowed or who are able, who are rich enough to live in those areas. Because even if we discover it, as we have done, and write extensive articles about it and study it, that's simply suggesting that those areas are useful for mental health, but it's not suggesting how do we give it to other people? Mm. So I think that's a, moving almost forward beyond the understanding that we need more nature. We're not even at the stage where we're, where we're all accepting of the fact that nature is essential for our mental health. But once we get to there, mm. we need to, I think, have in mind, but we don't want to stop here. We want it to be for everyone. We want mm. it to be available for everyone. And that's useful because it will change the structure of our cities. Mm. Um, another conversation that I have with people oftentimes is how to make nature more accessible. And that often means that we have to restructure cities because that's part of the plan. And a lot of cities are already doing it in Europe. So it can be done. But the blueprints are already there for cities like Amsterdam. And you know these are large cities with a lot of people and extensive public um, networks and public services. They can do it, London can do it, mm. other places can do it, um, you know, cities in India can do it. These are examples, but we need resources, we need people with lived experience, and we need research into it and plans. And that, again, that requires so many different things, but that gives me hope because yeah. the blueprints are there and we've got the answers. And we do evidently have people who care. So let's just do it. <laughs> what are we waiting for? Um, did we have any more questions? Yes, please. Hi. Uh, should depopulation be a thing? Should it be an ambition? May I answer that? So, did you say um, depopulation? So that's something I feel quite strongly about, actually. Um, so I have had quite a few conversations with people who deal with biodiversity in um, certain countries where the populations are quite high. Um, and from what I've gathered and the research that I've done and the people that I've talked to, 
it's not a useful future to think about. Um, and for me, what I'm really thinking about is how have we got to that question? How have we got to the point where we've suggested that the only way that we can save the climate crisis is by getting rid of people? And why are we not thinking about all these other approaches to it? For example, our energy usage, how, you know, how are we providing food for people? What are we providing for people? Because even if you think about just waste management and food management, we produce too much food anyway, which only goes to a few people. We produce a lot of waste, that could go to people. Our housing, we have loads of empty housing for loads of people that could be used. Our structure, you know, the structure of cities is so that entire areas of London are empty because they've been bought up by rich, you know, people who just simply use it for one, um, one thing and they don't really know that there's anybody else who needs it because they haven't taken the time to understand that. So in my mind's eye, when people bring up depopulation, it's because they've not been educated on any of the other ways to deal with this climate crisis. And if you think about it, there is enough land in the world for people to exist. And even if there wasn't, that would not be our call to make, I think. So one of the things that I also like to talk about is that when I want an, e an equal and fair future, what I'm not asking for is that my race or gender or whatever be considered above anyone else's. But what I'm suggesting is that the people who have held the microphone for as long as it is up till now have monopolized on it for too long and it wasn't their call to make. It's not my call to make whether or not populations are high or not because my family is not going to be the one that's, that's depopulized first and we know this. We know that when people talk about depopulation, what they're talking about is countries where people are suffering from, you know, being too, too many people in certain areas, not enough food, not enough water, not enough products for them to use, not enough hygiene. And that is having a negative effect on the climate, but it really isn't their fault because the infrastructure is not there to take care of them. And what we should be focusing on, how do we get to a place where people can be provided for equally? How do we get to a place where people can be provided for in a way that they are healthy, they are happy? Then we can talk about how we talk, how population works and population structure, because then what's not causing our conversation to be biased is the fact that they can't speak about it or it's a problem that we can deal with by getting rid of them and then we'll be fine. So I think in a way it's not even a question, but in a way it's something that needs to be thinked about because, thinked about, thought about, um, you, you should be asking, everyone should be asking, why are we talking about depopulation, not why isn't bee population happening, I think. Can I just add something? Yes, uh, of course. Um, I think, um, sorry, I can't really see you. Um, I do think we need to talk about degrowth, though, which is, I think, um, I'm hearing about it more and more, um, which is quite um, exciting. But I think we need to look at, you know, from my perspective, and I'm no expert, but population isn't necessarily the issue. It's consumption is the issue. And the majority of the issues caused across the world are, um, you know, one of the sources of those issues is um, consumption and the amount of energy and resources that have to go into production, um, whether it's in the West or, of course, of course, across the world. And degrowth, I think, is this, you know, it's a new, whether you're talking about it in a sort of more formal sense or casual sense, it's a framework for, you know, managing reduction of consumption. And that's essential because the more, um, especially the people who are privileged who have more than they need, and we know, like we're saying, with food, we, ha we waste, I think, I'm going to get this wrong, I always get my stats wrong, I think we waste up to a third of the food that's produced, especially in the West. Um, the more we can manage reduction in how we consume and see degrowth as a really viable pathway to a, you know, a, a viable future, I think um, the better off we'll be. So, yeah, the big word for me this year is degrowth. Can I just add something as well? Um, I think there have, I'm pretty sure there are like hard facts on this, but we do know absolutely that we do have enough resources for the population that we have of the planet. It's absolutely an allocation of those resources. There's also stats around the fact that some of this is to do with system, the systems of living in a fossil fuel like economy, where someone in the UK right now who is um, unhoused, experiencing homelessness, will still have a higher carbon footprint. They will still produce more emissions than someone living in a global south country, which is often where people target this idea about population. They say this country in Africa, in Asia, often without any real specifics or numbers there. But 
anyone in that popu anyone of the population in those countries who may have high populations are not producing anywhere near the amount of emissions that someone who could live in London and actually be experiencing homelessness would still produce passively because of the systems that are set up on a large scale in the way that places like the UK are run. And degrowth is part of that as well, actually. It's looking at things on a countrywide level. And that is also the part of this conversation about why Western countries, uh, global North countries like the UK, like the USA, should be focusing on this first. Because actually, basically, it's a bit of a straw man argument um, because essentially, removing uh, or depopulating those countries that actually have very little impact from a numbers perspective but it does lend very well into arguments of, peop of people who are very potentially would like an authoritarian type of future which is not the type of future that is going to help any of our mental well-being or the planet or you know any of us <laughs> long term um, yeah thank you so much I'm really aware of time I mean this is <laughs> it's so huge um, and, I, and you guys have been absolutely fantastic. We've just got, I just wanted to ask you, there's one question that's come in online, um, and it's just a really, maybe a quick one for each person to finish up, if that's okay. Um, can the panel please share one simple idea for an act of kindness for the planet, which ultimately helps our mental health too? Um, so, I don't know, maybe there's something you regularly do for your own mental health or an act of kindness or, or some, something like that that you're involved in. Is that... Anyone got one? If you've got one, come to... Yeah, go for it. Um, so, the thing that I always love to do whenever I'm feeling anxious, uh, well, particularly anxious about the climate, um, is simply just to go outside, uh, get down on the ground and just find something that's living and small and just get involved with their world and just watch just watch stuff happening. So whether that's like a moss and just imagining sort of being, I don't know, the size of like a little beetle sat next to this moss and just imagining what it must look like. I don't know if anyone's wandered through, well, here or, or the rainforest biome today, but that experience of these enormous plants, this is, this is what a moss looks like to a little, you know, springtail or something and just, Imagining what it's like to be in that world and watching things like ants running around and beetles and things, um, or even just, you know, watching robins. Um, I just find that so grounding. And I'm kind of like, this is what it's all about. This is, you can get so much joy from these tiny, tiny things um, that can be found anywhere. Even, you know, in the middle of the most concreted parts of cities, there's always a little bit of moss to find or, you know, a springtail. Um, yeah, so that sort of, grounding very very little thing to do but i find that really really grounds me amazing thank mm. you yeah. hi oh. imogen i'll just go to imogen then jasmine uh so i think it's about keeping this conversation going and talking to people learning about their different experiences their opinions and sometimes it can be a little bit tricky but one person's voice is a message but a collective group is a mission and i think that's exactly what we have here today Thank you. Lovely. Jasmine. Okay. Well, can we go in? Oh, yeah, then order? I can go. <laughs> in order. Um, yeah, I would say please join your local climate justice group. Or if there's a really specific thing that you really care about, if it's plastic, if it's biodiversity, look up what is happening in your area. Um, I've definitely found by taking action, firstly, the more people get involved, the more people are able to have a rest and the sort of burden gets spread. And then actually, it's everyone is doing within their means and no one's getting burned out. Um, I've also been really fortunate, the local, or like the climate action uh, groups that I've been part of, I've met some of the best people ever and I've made such strong, wonderful friendships that are really formed in solidarity. And then it sounds <laughs> so rubbish to be like, hang out with your friends. But you know, you're hanging out with people who get it and often want to do things like go for a wild swim or lie on the ground and look at beetles. So sort of they feed into each other and then also more of us um, can be pesky activists, which is very important. <laughs> I have two ways of dealing with the anxiety um, and you don't have to listen to both of them. One is to listen to really loud metal. So you don't have to do that one. Um, but the other one is to um, do any small act of kindness for any bit of wildlife that you can. Um, that really helps me because on, again, on a small level, it's so connecting. Mm -hmm. It allows you to really sort of see the natural world as something that you can help. 
because we always get told, I think, that we have to help nature on this massive, massive scale. And we can't do that. A lot of us can't do that. And part of focusing more sort of blame on larger corporate structures and focusing more positive um, passion, emotion, and comfort on individuals is allowing you to see that you can do things on a small level and still help. And you don't have to shoulder all the blame of the climate crisis. And one of the ways we can do that, I think, is by helping small animals. For example, feeding birds, for example, planting very small <laughs> plants. Anything that's a small act of natural positivity, I think is very, very comforting and very, very quelling of any anxiety that you might have. And it is helping the environment on that minute level. If you think about the fact that for a very, very small insect, the planting of one plant is quite a major, it's quite a major thing in their lives because they're, they don't live for that long and they're very small. So that is something that's gonna be around for probably their entire lives, even if it's around for a fraction of hours. And it's something that really affects them in a positive way. And I think, um, like Leif said, you know, when you think about it like that, it's it's quite useful. And then after a time, you can build to bigger things. But start off with the small things and break it all down because that can really help, I think, with any sort of stress and anxiety. Um, and listen to metal because that's pretty cool. Um, I was going to talk about birds as well. <laughs> so sort of, um, I would yeah, I say look after the birds. They're such an important part of the food chain and. Um, uh, they're just bird song is my favorite thing in the world and it's what if anything makes me feel all right in terms of anxiety it's listening to birds um, but you've already said birds so I'm just going to very quickly say um, also I've got to say something about fashion but join the sustainable fashion community because our focus is on community-led action and it's on um, grassroots level sharing of skills and knowledge to enable everybody to improve their relationship with clothing and obviously clothing matters enormously we all need to wear clothing as much as we need to eat food especially at this time of year in England and the British Isles um, so really rethink your relationship with clothing and join in with what we're doing because the more we can people like us can gather together and inspire other people who may not know as much about what's going on in the fashion industry and may not know as much about its impact if we can inspire them again at a grassroots level we can just reach more people and collectively change what's happening thank you thank you so much um i'm really sorry if you sent a question online or you had a question we didn't get round to it's such a massive conversation um but thank you to you guys for being here with me and thank you to you guys <laughs>